Today on The Simple Truth, called to Compiègne, a new book that tells the story of the 16 intrepid Carmelite nuns who were martyred for their faith during the French Revolution. I'm Jim Havens. We consecrate everything to the Sacred Heart of Jesus through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and the pure, strong, chaste heart of St. Joseph. And uh, we are very blessed to have the author of Called to Compiègne with us today, Jonathan Michael O'Brien. Welcome to The Simple Truth. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you for having me on. Excellent. Great blessing to have you with us and to uh, talk about this very important uh, historical event and these uh, these beautiful martyrs. And so let's start with the backstory. Um, how and when um, did this story about the 16 martyred Carmelite nuns of Compiègne capture your attention? Yeah, it was actually during Lent of this year, so not that long ago, and I was surprised that I had never heard of this before. I think it was off of a YouTube video I was watching, but uh, yeah, I was just fascinated by the story and moved by it, so I started to look a little deeper and see what literature I could find on it, and yeah, that's, that's what got me started with this. Yeah, if it's the same YouTube clip, YouTube clip that uh, that I've seen, which was the first one to alert me to this whole story and this event, um, yeah, very uh, captivating, um, where you hear the nuns um, singing, and then um, as they're going to to their death by guillotine, um, the 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 chorus grows one less until there's only uh, one nun left singing, and then. Uh, the silence after after she is uh, she is martyred she is executed by the guillotine, and um, and what a scene that would have been. We're going to get to that um, in the book today. That's one of the most poignant uh, points, I would say. But um, but you open up the book with I think something that probably a lot of folks don't know about in this um, introductory chapter. Um, you go all the way back to 1693. Uh, to the monastery of Carmel in uh, Compiègne. Um, why Why is that important to go back there? What happened then that is important to this story? Yeah, so the the prioress of the monastery, when this all happened, when they were guillotined, Mother Teresa of St. Augustine, so she was looking through the archives of the monastery, and she came across this mystic dream that one of the sisters had almost 100 years before in uh, 1693, and it's uh, so what happened was this woman, she was partially paralyzed. They had doubts about her becoming a Carmelite, but she was living in the monastery at the time. And in her mystic dream, she saw Jesus and she saw him walk into her cell. Um, St. Teresa of Avila was there who founded the Carmelite order, the deceased prioress of her own monastery. And then she said that after that, her and the other sisters were, they found themselves out in the corridor, just transported with joy. And Jesus was appearing to them as a lamb, and he was separating some of the nuns on one side and some on the other side. And the ones he put on one side were called to follow the lamb. And in her dream, 16 of them were placed on one side to follow the lamb, and three were placed on the other side. And a hundred years later, when these nuns were executed, 16 of them went to the guillotine, and three of them survived because they weren't at the monastery at the time they were arrested. Yeah, amazing. I mean, there is, as you go through the story, um, there's something that strikes you in terms of divine providence in all of this, much like um, the, um, the story of our Lord Jesus himself, you know, he came for a specific purpose and in, you know, freely laying himself down, um, in his own sacrifice, in his own death to which all of this flows from. And so they would have had a great love of Jesus. Obviously they would have known the gospel well, and that was the center of their lives. And so then to be asked by God to really participate in this way, um, it was at first, it seems, um, you know, maybe maybe quite a, a bitter sense to it, but very quickly it became very sweet. And I guess I want to go there right away. Why wait? Um, one of the most um, wonderful things, I think, in the, in the story, in the book that you lay out here is how the, the mother prioress, um, what a great leader, what, what a wonderful leader she is, um, and how she... Sister Therese of of Saint Augustine, and how she prepared the other 
nuns for this. She had a good sense of it a couple years before it all went down. And so she would have them praying this consecration prayer, really this um, offering prayer, this sort of Holocaust prayer that they would pray, preparing their own minds and hearts and souls to freely lay down their lives should the time come. And she had the sense that it would. And so just what preparation, the immediate preparation of those two years of them really being prepared for this moment. And then when the moment does come, you can't imagine anyone going to their martyrdom in a more admirable way on a human level and more of a grace filled way on a supernatural level. Um, anything that you want to share about that? How, how did that, how does that aspect of the story uh, strike you? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think it's very important because I, I think Mother Teresa of St. Augustine, there were more confirmations than just this mystic dream that uh, they were supposed to follow the Lamb. And, you know, when she was in Paris before their arrest, there was a cart of people headed towards the guillotine and her and um, another one of the nuns were kind of forced right up to the side of the carts by the crowd. And these two men were looking at them in a certain way, like they were about to follow. And then there was another, another instance in Paris right after this, where this young girl was dying. She was on her deathbed and a, a bishop was ministering to her and she was seeing a vision and she was seeing a vision that, that God wanted to sacrifice his spouses, you know, it, it had a lot of parallels with the mystic vision that we talked about at the beginning. And, you know, this must have been a very profound confirmation for Mother Teresa of St. Augustine. And she really saw it as an honor that our Lord would give her such a share of his glory. And he was the, the first and greatest martyr. And, and by just, you know, by showing the world his goodness, he rebuked the world and was crucified for it. And and, you know, they really, these nuns, they, they followed the lamb. They, they imitated Christ. And instead of a cross, it was a guillotine. But, you know, when the world has kind of lost its mind around them, they rebuked the world just by showing it what good looks like. And so Mother Teresa of St. Augustine, she had her nuns do this act of consecration, this act of Holocaust. And uh, when she initially proposed this to the other nuns, this is after they'd already been kicked out of their monastery and they couldn't even wear their religious habits because they were illegal at this time. So, so she kind of had a sense of what was coming. But, you know, of course, it was initially met with shock and resistance by some of the nuns, but that didn't last very long. And after that, they started praying this act of Holocaust. And this is about two years before their execution. And, you know, I, I think she knew better than to rely on their own strength and fallen nature for this kind of undertaking. And, you know, she, she knew that this act of consecration would help them all be spiritually prepared for when the time came. And, you know, the last hymn they sung on earth was the Veni Creator, Come Holy Spirit. So, you know, she, she knew how much they were, how dependent they were on the Lord to be able to even, you know, even undertake this martyrdom. Yeah, for sure. And uh, that also comes out in the point where it's the um, the night before, I think, the eve of their death, the night before what would be their trial and then their execution, their martyrdom. And uh, this would have been on their great feast day of Our Lady of Mount Carmel, July 16th. Uh, they were martyred on the 17th. And um, just, a, a, again, a beautiful... Um, just a beautiful um, unfolding of events that would take place where they would um, they, they would write this hymn together, write this song together, uh, basically on the eve of their death. And uh, one of those lines in there is, Great God who sees my weakness, I always desire and fear, confident ardor urges me. Weak, I await your help. Weak, I await your help. I cannot hide my fear from you going to the dungeons to death. But be for me the strong God, and let me walk there without constraint. Miss this beautiful moment. I'm waiting for my change. Lord, Lord, without delay, make my heart content. 
And so you get this sense of where their hearts really were and where their minds were, this humility, this reliance upon the grace of God right where it ought to be. And wow, did he come through for them and did they achieve that death that they desired um, at peace um, with their, their hearts and their, their lives fixed on God himself and offering themselves uh, for his glory. And just what a beautiful uh, a beautiful offering was made there, undeniable to the people that were in the crowd that usually are hurling such ins- insults, falling silence, even a reverence uh, coming over everybody. Uh, we'll have much more when we get back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here talking with author Jonathan Michael O'Brien today and his book called to Comp- uh, called to uh Compien, Compien, getting the pronunciation right here, Compien. And um, yeah, this is a book, again, you know, we have various authors on here talk about various books. I'm always encouraging you uh, to keep reading and bringing these wonderful books to your attention. Uh, This one I really want to emphasize because not only is it something that you definitely want to read through one, one time and really Make sure you, you are really soaking in this story and you have a good understanding of what happened here. So many lessons, uh, for us in this. But I think it's, it's something even of a, of a reference book or something to go back to time and time again. Um, because there's just so many little things here that I think are going to, um, just inspire you, be very helpful for you in building yourself up in, in a strong faith and in the life that we're called to. And yeah, in, in particular with that, well, I, I guess, you know, first let me point out this is that, um, the book is broken up in, in a way where, so, so Jonathan gives kind of brings it all together and gives a great account, a great telling of the story, bringing in the various, um, reference texts, the source texts that exist. And then, um, and then he gives us one of those source texts, uh, in the second half of the book, basically. And this is the work of Sister Marie of the Incarnation or Mary of the Incarnation. Um, she was one of the Carmelite nuns there that, um, that wasn't with them at the time when they were arrested and martyred. And so it seems that God, um, had other plans for her and to really write this story, write the account. Otherwise, we wouldn't know many of these um, details or aspects of the story. So we have that in here as well. And so that's something that I think would be a great blessing to you as well. And and this name, this uh, sister um, Mary of the Incarnation or Marie of the Incarnation, it jumped out to me and it gives something of her bio in there as well. She took the name great story in and of herself, uh, her biography, but she ended up taking the name after she was healed of a terrible illness, I think in her twenties and, and then um, entered Carmel and took the name of, um, of blessed Marie of the incarnation. I don't know if she would have been beatified by that point or not, maybe not, but, um, but she certainly would have been um, thought of with very high regard. And this was the the woman who really brought, I think, Carmel to France and also um, Saint Marie of the Incarnation, who just shortly after Blessed Marie of the Incarnation, she she was an Ursuline sister, went to New France, Quebec, and um, and she did great work there. We did a whole show on her not long ago. But there's again, there there's so much when you start pulling on the thread of these stories, this um, this lineage of holiness that you could go through just in terms of the Carmelite order and, and specifically um, there in France. And, and so um, the more you learn about this, the more you want to learn more and the more I think our Lord and our lady just kind of pull you deep into these beautiful stories of these faithful, faithful people while um, they're tapping on your heart saying, Hey, I want you to be uh, growing in faith and becoming more like this, right? In whatever state in life you are in, Let's go there, Jonathan. Any any personal sense of your own in, in learning this story and reading through it and compiling it? I mean, you you really had to spend a lot of time with this and get to know it and get to know these nuns quite intimately to really put this book together. How has it? How how would you say it's changed you in the process? 
Oh, I, I mean, I don't think anybody could read the words of these nuns and just see their example and, and not have it affect them. And, you know, just from hearing the fact that these nuns were singing on their way to the death and being guillotined alone, you know, that was, that's enough to send chills down your spine. But like you said, the, the deeper you dig into this, the more you start to see. And even after writing the book, I'm still finding coincidences now <laughs> that I didn't even notice when I was writing the book. And like you said, the Lord just draws you deeper into these stories. And I, I feel like I was being drawn deeper into this. And I was, uh, like I said, I looked up every book I could find on it. And, um, you know, I, I was finding things that either were loosely based on it and kind of took some artistic liberties for the sake of telling the story or some things that were more kind of uh, almost like a textbook on it. But uh, I wasn't finding anything that was just a telling of the story with a beginning, middle, and end. So I was realizing that the book I wanted to read on this didn't exist, but all the pieces were there just waiting to be put together. And, and I felt, you know, I, I felt compelled to. I, it wasn't, I, I don't, even remember deciding, hey, I'm going to write a book. I just, you know, I got sucked so deeply into this that I, I couldn't stop. And before you know it, I was, you know, I, I wanted to hear from one of the surviving nuns themselves. So I was translating the French account of uh, Sister Marie. And yeah, I, I just, from there, you know, it was almost like I was, uh, there was no going back. I, I wanted the, the experiences that I felt and, you know, just just everything I experienced looking at the example of these nuns, I didn't want to rob the rest of the world of that experience that I had reading about them. So I thought it was absolutely imperative that I write this and try to get it in the hands of as many people as possible. Yeah, that's right. I forgot about that. You write about that in the book, how... Um, this was not Sister Marie's account um, was in French. It had not. You, there was no English translation of it. And so you took it on yourself to say, all right, I, it's not going to be perfect, but I'm going to do my best here and, and uh, give it my best shot at translating this. Yeah, thanks for doing that. And um, and you also do say in there um, anybody who uh, maybe is more proficient as far as a translator in French to English, um, feel free to come on by and, and take another pass at it. This deserves to be um, done well. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, it seems that, um, you know, everything I can tell from the translation uh, seems great and very blessed to have it. There's also the history as we read this. If somebody's not um, well well versed in the French Revolution, that period of history, I mean, that it's a it is a what a wild period of history. It doesn't seem to be talked about enough um, as far as what actually went down there, or what actually happened, and why, and, and to really talk about the the barbarism of it all and the. The, the the viciousness, the evil that was, that was turned towards towards the Catholic Church and those members, those faithful members of the Catholic Church who would not renounce their faith. What was your sense of the? Um, what was your understanding of the French Revolution going in? And then again, doing the work. Um, what maybe did you come to learn about the French Revolution that um, would have been um, surprising or, or something that you think that? Um, would be good to just share with people so we make sure people really understand what happened there. Yeah, I didn't know much at all about the French Revolution before this, and I think it's a topic that's largely glossed over in school, uh, at least in, in our country. I didn't learn much about it, and I feel like it's been grossly misrepresented when it is taught about. I don't remember hearing any mention whatsoever of the attempted dechristianization of France that came hand in hand, part and parcel with the revolution. And I think to leave that part out is just lying by omission if you're going to teach about the French Revolution and not include that. And I guess I was under the impression that it was something similar to the American Revolution, another manifestation of classical liberalism. But when I started reading into it and seeing how the events played out, how the characters in the story conducted themselves, I really couldn't differentiate much between the French Revolution and the Bolshevik Revolution. And I was uh, very surprised to see that and to, to know that as interested in history as I've always been, 
I was first learning about this at the age of 35, and I was pretty indignant at that. Yeah, I agree. I had the the same experience reading through it. In fact, you know, I had um, some experience uh, maybe a year ago or so, some sense of something got into my mind about the French Revolution where it was like, I really need to look more into this and understand more about the French Revolution. And I was kind of looking around to find out, you know, what would be a good resource to do that. And, um, you know, I, I never did come across the, the resource that I was looking for. Um, and then this book hit my radar and I think it's right, uh, right exactly w- what I needed to read. And, um, and yeah, it, it, reading through it, it raises so many more questions now that I have. I'm very, very curious to learn more about what happened there. The, the way you tell the stories about King Louis the 16th, Marie Antoinette, it's a way that I've never really, I've never heard those stories. I've never heard them described in more positive terms in the way that you describe them. I'd, I'd like to learn more about that. What, what were they really like? I, I think, you know, there's almost like a caricature version of Marie Antoinette that we get. Uh, is it, is that fair? Is that accurate? Not, I mean, the, the view that we get of her in this book um, is not that view at all. And so anything that you want to share about, um, about either of them and, and anything that you take away in terms of their lives? Yeah, and I, I totally know what you mean about feeling like you need to look deeper into the French Revolution because I felt the same way. I felt like, okay, well, this is uh, basically a black hole in my historical knowledge. And, you know, when after looking into it and some other things like the, uh, the Spanish Civil War, I'm realizing that if you feel like something is a, a black hole or has just been glossed over, you know, that, that's probably something you should be reading about <laughs> because you're going to learn something you didn't know. And And um, I think, you know, in terms of being grossly misrepresented, I don't know if it gets any worse than Marie Antoinette. You know, she's known for saying the famous line, let them eat cake and and just being flippant about the the woes of the common people. But uh, she never said that, for one. And uh, from what I read, that doesn't seem even close to the mark. You know, one of these... uh, the prioress herself, Mother Teresa of St. Augustine, couldn't afford her own dowry to go into the Carmelite Monastery, and Marie Antoinette paid it out of her own pocket. And uh, King Louis, he was known as Le Bon Roi, or uh, the Le Bon Roi, excuse my atrocious French pronunciation, but the good king. So uh, he was very well respected and liked by the common people. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I need to uh, definitely uh, get more acquainted uh, with them and this time in history. And again, that's why I say just one reading of this book called uh, Compiègne is not enough. It really is something that um, I think maybe we are um, so filled with some of the wrong ideas uh, that we really are going to need some repetition on the right ones to really uh, get our focus on it. But make sure to, to get the book. We're going to be right back to talk more about it. But wherever books are sold, call to Compiègne. We're going to be right back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with Jonathan Michael O'Brien, author of the book called to Compiègne. You can get it now wherever books are sold. And I want to go to the chapter, chapter 19 on the execution and just read a little bit of the book. Um, this is what it says. It says, upon arriving at the guillotine, normally the cart would be unloaded and the condemned would be seated on a bench near the foot of and facing away from the scaffold. To be the first to go would take tremendous courage, but to be the last to go would take unmatched fortitude and was seen as the least desirable place in the order. As the Carmelites were brought to the foot of the scaffold without any regard for typical guillotine etiquette, the Reverend Mother Prioress Therese of St. Augustine or St. Augustine approached her executioner and asked if he could do her a favor and allow her to go last. This execution was not going to be like the others. The request was granted and she was allowed to see off each of her nuns as they took their turn. Time was also given for each of the nuns to renew their baptismal promises and renew their vows. For Sister Constance, she would be pronouncing them for the first time. They began singing the Veni Creator, um, and it would be the final hymn this choir would sing on earth. Uh, it, It goes on. This account is, just to read this account alone, 
is well worth getting this book. It's just so amazing. And if you've seen that YouTube clip, as striking as that is, um, there's really so much more in terms of the details of what actually um, it took place here. Just so, so incredible. And so um, I guess one thing that jumped out to me here, and I was wondering, Jonathan, if you would have an answer on this. It, it seems like, so Sister Constance, she was unable to take her religious vows because that was made illegal um, at a certain point, a, a few years before that. Um, and so um, I guess they they would have followed that. I guess in my mind, I, I, I wonder why. I mean, there's a there's a certain line for everybody, or I, at least there ought to be in terms of what they're going to go along with and not go along with when they're being pushed. And so they were being pushed big time by this uh, this evil uh, within the, the government and within uh, the, the people that were rising up and taking power at that point in France. And, you know, when they were told it's now illegal, no more religious vows, I guess I wonder why they would go along with that. It seems like they did. But then in the end, you know, maybe it's just divine providence setting it up for um, this beautiful last moment of of, I guess, disobedience, where she then takes the vow in front of everybody right before she goes to her martyrdom. I don't know. Um, but uh, any any sense, um, as you reflect on that, um, anything that you'd like to add on that? Yeah, so I mean, for for a lot of the, the church and the clergy and the faithful in France at the time, they had never seen anything like this. So I, I think in the beginning, they were probably very unsure how to react. You know, I, I know that the Carmelites, they were dependent on their chaplain and, and other members of the church for a lot of things. And uh, the nuns going into the monastery, the most recent ones were at this time were Sister St. Frat, Sister St. Francis and Sister Constance. And they already knew at this point that by entering the monastery, they were facing persecution. And the prioress actually told Sister St. Francis about this and, and just wanted to make sure that, you know, if you join this monastery, you may be in prison, deported, maybe even killed. And uh, she said, as long as I can give myself to the Lord, I'm happy whatever happens to me. And you know, the taking of vows, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure about that. I, I think, uh, so normally a Carmelite would come in, she would be clothed in, in the habit, and then a year after that, she would take her vows. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure why they didn't just take them anyway, but uh, you, you can see later on that they were kind of getting more of a handle on what was happening. Like, for instance, the new government wanted to take that, take this oath called the the oath of liberty and equality and even their chaplain said that you know okay this is a watered down version of the oath that they're trying to get us to take so you can take it and you don't have to worry about your conscience if you take it but they they still just said no we're not taking the oath and they refused to and uh they they were just disgusted by it and what actually happened is the mayor of the town tricked them into putting their names on a blank sheet of paper and then he put the oath above their signatures and then went around town telling everybody that he got them to take the oath <laughs> so just some some libel and perjury on the mayor's part but yeah and then you know from then on i i think they they were doing their best to walk that tightrope between you know humility and obedience and and then not doing things that would go against their faith and their conscience and i think uh, for somebody seeing these kinds of crazy things for the first time that might have been difficult and confusing to do at first yeah yeah it makes a lot of sense i mean and also they you see that in them a real yeah sense of of true, true prudence, the true right reason, and that they weren't reckless at all. Um, they were very measured in what they were doing, what their responses were, and they were really striving to be faithful and do things the right way. I'm talking about the uh, the, the nuns of Compiègne now, and um, all other underneath the um, the leadership of the uh, of the mother prioress. And so, you know, they they even even with the fact that there was a sense that. Yeah, I think this might end in our martyrdom and to the point where, yeah, we freely give ourselves to that. And we even, we even desire it when we really see it for what it really is. Um, okay. Yeah. We give a enthusiastic yes to this call. Um, should we be called to this? And yet still, though, 
they're not running recklessly forward saying, martyr me, martyr me. They're still, yeah, just living their daily lives of faith. I mean, they left the, um, the monastery once they were told they had to leave the monastery. I think this is fascinating where in the beginning they're being, they're being thought of as, oh, we're going to go, uh, uh, we're, we're going to go to that monastery and tell these nuns that they can leave and they're going to be so happy that they can leave because this is like a prison to them. They hate it there. They're going to be so glad to be free. They went there and this, and the nuns are like, Look, we're already free. We we've left the world for this life for a reason, and 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 we're good, you know. And so, um, there's some beautiful words in the book about this and about the the beauty of religious life, and um and then um when they were kicked out and they could go anywhere, they didn't go back to their. Um, families or just scatter like they could have. They were placed in four houses. They couldn't be all together, but four different houses where they could go and continue to be faithful to their religious um, vows and, and rule of life. And so they still lived that rule of life that they were living in the monastery, even when they were um, put in, into a different um, different location. And so that's where their hearts were. They they wanted to live as religious sisters, as Carmelites, and um, and uh, and then right the the folks that were saying, oh, we're, we're acting like they had their best interest at heart. Oh, we're going to go and free them. By the end, are looking to kill them, right? So I mean, um, how fickle and how what a what a nonsensical game uh, they're even playing in their own minds, acting like they cared about um, these sisters. Clearly, they didn't. Um, there was a depravity that was let loose in this time, and it really was the evil one himself that was uh, running wild, and people were participating um, in these in these great evils. Um, just a, a, a terrible time, and they um, they felt the brunt of it. So yeah, these oaths. Um, you, you mentioned that one. That's a good distinction. That one oath with respect to the religious, um, consecrated religious, the oath of liberty and equality, a watered down version of the one given to the priests in 1790. And so um, a lot of the priests took this oath that, that they would swear, um, primary loyalty to the government of France rather than to the Pope. I think ultimately they were excommunicated for doing this. Um, and so there was this schism uh, between the priests that took the oath and the priests that didn't take the oath of the, um, the, the, the non-juring priests, the ones who, who I guess um, didn't take the oath and then the juring priests of the ones who, who did take the oath. And that's very interesting, uh, that whole dynamic that was going on. And, um, and that also brings back to Marie Antoinette and how as she's preparing for her execution, um, she wants to go to confession. She's a Catholic woman. I mean, I've never heard any of this before. She wants to go to confession. All that she, all that they would give her is one of these priests who had taken the oath, who would have been excommunicated. And so she's like, no, I'm not going to confession to him. Um, and so she wasn't able to go to confession. There was no priest in, um, in, in good standing who hadn't taken the oath that they would allow her to talk to. And so she wasn't able, she, obviously she had that desire and that's, um, that's good to know. So, um, yeah, God rest her soul. But yeah, anything else about that dynamic with the, um, again, everybody, you know, th- there's a line here. And so a lot of people, I guess, in a sort of false prudence playing games with themselves saying, ah, I can take this oath and still be, uh, you know, a good priest. And, uh, those priests who said, no, there's no way I'm going to take this oath. And they suffered the consequences. I mean, hundreds of, pe- of priests were, were killed during the French Revolution. I believe three, uh, Catholic bishops as well. Um, so it really, you know, they're, they're, they're basically saying I'm willing to die for the faith by not taking that oath. Um, and there were some that did some that didn't your thoughts. It's kind of reminiscent of what happened in England with the church, but, uh, a little different. And yeah, there was really a, a schism because of this con- civil constitution of the clergy, they called it. And there was actually a, a civil war over this in the Vendée region in the west of France. And a lot of the non juring priests, the ones who didn't take the oath, they went into hiding. They continued to minister to their flocks in hiding. And before the end, they were being herded onto boats in the river and drowned in boats in mass in the river. 
So it's, uh, you know, another one of those aspects of the French Revolution that you just don't really hear about. I mean, there were thousands of martyrs for their faith. And uh, who knows what other stories there are from these these other martyrs. But, you know, fortunately for us, Sister Marie was able to survive and write all this down. Otherwise, this story had been lost like, like the other ones. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, God has, has blessed us with the account from Sister Marie, and uh, and yeah, we should mention as well. So all all of the uh, all of the the nuns of Compiègne, they did while they were, I think, while they were after they were arrested and being held in terrible conditions. I believe that was when um, the the mother said for the mayor and the officials to come back, the ones who had tricked them into into signing that blank piece of paper. And then they wrote the oath on afterwards saying, no, no, we wouldn't do that to you. And they did. And then, um, and then when they came and faced her, they said they didn't know why. And, and she said, look, we want to retract. We want to retract all of that. It, it may, it, I don't know if I'm getting the timeline right exactly when I think it was when they were already arrested, but um, they, they made it clear that they were tricked, they want to retract, and they did retract. And then Sister Marie, after um, after the execution, um, she came back something like a year or so later and went into the mayor and the officials and said, I also want to retract. And, um, and so she did as well. And when she did, the clerk there in that office was the former parish priest um, who had taken, it says, this this man weak and without energy, she describes him, had only accepted the position of clerk to escape persecution. I dictated to him word by word the formula for my withdrawal. I noticed that while he was writing, his hand was trembling and big tears were rolling down his eyes. You need a lot of courage, madam, to act like this, he told me. And I fear for the consequences of the action that could be considered rash. And... Um, this is the difference, right? What side are we on? God bless us with the virtue of fortitude. We'll be right back. Stay tuned. Welcome back to The Simple Truth. Jim Havens here with Jonathan Michael O'Brien talking about his book called The Compiègne today. Called The Compiègne, great book. Highly encourage you to get this wherever you find books. And um, one, one last thing, and then, uh, yeah, anything else you want to comment on today in this final segment, but... Um, the, the scene of the execution and how, um, mother Therese of St. Um, St. Augustine, the only one left. Um, and it says here, she kissed the statue of the woman who knew her grief all too well. Um, that was a, a statue of our lady, um, that she held. And then, um, it says you write beautifully here, the, the 15 swords that had just pierced her heart must have eased her own approach to the machine that would end her grief. But as she kissed the statue of the Blessed Virgin, she paused, not knowing what to do with it. Even now, her acute sense of reverence made its demands, and she could not allow this blessed statue to be profaned by going with her into the mass grave or being looted by the executioners. Searching desperately, her eyes rested on a woman in the crowd who gave her a knowing look. With a wave of relief, she handed her the statuette and and it goes from there. But what about that sense here at the execution? There's this sense that people knew, right? The the sense of like the the Roman centurion who has that sense as our Lord Jesus is crucified. Uh, This was, this, this man was, was, was true. This man was who he said he was. These, these, women were faithful. The, 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 the witness to the faith seemed to bear fruit almost immediately in the reaction in the crowd. I think it's written here, one woman in the crowd even saying, um, if, if, uh, if heaven exists, surely these women will be there. And so something very clear uh, was proclaimed in their actions on that day. And then very quickly after, things seemed to really take a turn and uh, some of these folks like Robespierre and various figures of depravity that were leading this whole thing and the tables turned on them they're the ones then being uh, executed at the guillotine only days later nine ten days later um, what, what is your sense of that and what the uh, kind of the immediate fruits uh, of their martyrdom yeah you know I, I think um, people will often go along with things longer than they should, but I think when these women were martyred and everybody saw that, I, I think the, the mask was finally off 
of the revolution for a lot of people. And, uh, you know, you when it comes to the point to where you're guillotining, guillotining nuns, you have to know that you're on the wrong side. And, um, yeah, I mean, usually the, the crowds in Paris that would accompany these executions, they were virtually mobs, and they would throw things, and they would, uh, you know, throw insults at the condemned. And when King Louis was executed, they, they ran up with handkerchiefs to dip their handkerchiefs in his blood as a kind of memento. And um, But it, it wasn't the case with these women. You know, they were stunned into silence. And, yeah, I, I think uh, it, it just must have been that profound. And I, I don't really have the words for it, but um, they say the, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And I, I think that's, as, you know, it's especially true for these women. I think it was true when it happened, and I, I think it's still true now. Do you, do you have a, um, any sense of how the French people generally view the French Revolution today? How do they look back on it? How do they interpret it? Um, are they still in support of it or do they think that was terrible um how do they view the martyrdom of the the 16 um nuns in particular um is do, is there any sense of um of remorse of uh of wanting to um hold these hold these nuns up i know the faith is still in not a good place in france um any sense of how how they look at all of this today yeah, I can't really say, um, other than what I can glean from a few internet comments, you know, but uh, I, I guess I get the impression that a lot of French people don't know about this either, just like a lot of Americans aren't really very well acquainted with American history. And, uh, you know, there's when I was doing my research, I read a book on the French Revolution by Hilaire Bullock, who's French, and... I didn't even see mention of the Carmelites in there. So, and I may be wrong, maybe it's in there, but I don't remember seeing it. So I I guess my impression is that a lot of French people don't know about this, and maybe there's a reason for that. And I think if a lot of French people did know about this and all the gritty details of the French Revolution, they might think, oh, so that's how our government came to be? And they might start to question a lot of things. Any sense of, did you come across anything regarding um, our founding fathers in the United States that, um, what was their response at the time? I know this would have been a little bit later. These guys were young though, when the the American revolution went down, they would have, a lot of them still would have been around. Um, What about these figures that we, um, that we think so fondly of um, in, in our nation, the founding of our nation, did, were they against this as it was happening, or were they kind of in favor of it? Yeah, I, I think there were there were mixed opinions, but I think for the most part, a lot of our founding fathers would have been in the same or similar circles as who they call the philosophes or philosophes in France, um, just these kind of enlightened thinkers. And I know Thomas Jefferson expressed support of the revolutionaries and that kind of made me think twice about him but at the same time i i know there's other other things that he did that were honorable like fighting the barber and pirates and things like that but you know it definitely made me question you know where they were at but conversely you know you had people on the other side like uh uh, his name was Charette, and he, he fought for the king and fought for the, the rebels in the Vendée against the revolution. And, you know, he was French, but he had also served in the Continental Army during the American Revolution. So I, I, I think there was probably a range of opinions on either side. But, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question, and I think it definitely merits a, a deeper look. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Thank you for that. And, uh, anything you want to leave us with today? I only got about a, a minute or so to go, but, um, but yeah, what, what's your, uh, your parting comments for us today? Yeah, I would, I would just say, uh, even if you don't buy the book, please just share this story. I feel like it's a lot of people just don't know. And how can something help you if you've never read it? You know, that goes for people in France as well. I'm sure a lot of French people don't even know about this. So just spread the word. And, you know, when, if you do read the story, I think uh, the way Mr. Marie reported things and the way things played out, it's, it's the kind of story, just like the Gospels, that I think are beyond refutation. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I say you got to get the book. Again, called to Compiègne, uh, Jonathan Michael O'Brien. 
uh, the author. Thank you so much for being with us today. Again, you get the book wherever you find books called to Compiègne. And, um, and yeah, I really do believe that you're going to be very much um, blessed by it, edified by reading this book. And uh, in many ways, and one of the greatest ways, I think, is, is meeting these beautiful, these beautiful women, these beautiful nuns. And, um, and th- there's a lot in here that really gives you a sense of each one of them. And, um, and then to have them as your, um, as your friends in the church triumphant, call upon these holy intercessors. Uh, we need them, especially in times of trial, especially in times where um, we need to go against the grain um, for our Lord. And uh, there, may be, there may be more times like that coming. There's already times like that here. Um, get the book called The Compian. God bless you.